How's it going guys? It's Poetry Sud. Welcome back to episode 2 of the CK2 Guide mini-series, whatever it's called. <laughs> I don't really have a name, but welcome back. Uh, we're going to be explaining some more of the mechanics today. I will be explaining to you and uh, helping you understand if you've been looking to get in the game. Uh, if you missed episode 1, go back and watch it. We covered a lot of important stuff. The hierarchy of titles in this game, what each of your statistics mean. Uh, what your domain size is, and uh, that's about it. But that's a lot of important stuff. So, anyways, let's get back into it. So, what are we? What are we going to talk about this episode? Well, I think we're just going to go through each of the basic tabs here and probably get started in this episode. Uh, and I know it's been taking a while to get going, but if you uh, if you're really looking to understand the game, it's going to take a while. It's a grand strategy game. You can't, you know, you can't just hop in and know, expect to know everything, uh, unless you're really smart, smarter than me. <laughs> But uh, I'm sure some people can actually just understand everything right away. But um, yeah, so let's just let's just uh, let's just talk about what it, all these tabs mean up here because you're gonna be checking them a lot. You're, this is gonna be a lot of the game is checking this stuff. So let's just start at the beginning. You got your council here. So it looks like a lot. It's not actually that much, and you don't normally need to be doing stuff with them. You have the chancellor, the the chancellor, whatever you want to call it, however you want to say it. You have your marshal, you have your steward, you have your spy master, and you have your court chaplain. If you look at each of these names, and then look at uh, the stats, mm, excuse me, and look at your stats, it's pretty easy to see that they correspond to every single statistic. You have a diplomacy dude, a marshal dude, a stewardship dude, an intrigue dude, and a learning dude. It's kind of a weird way to put it, but it makes sense. You know, you have one person in your council essentially that basically says I'm gonna be you know they're the one who helps you and advises you on stuff and they normally don't actually do that but they basically it, it's a game analog for that uh, they don't actually like give you advice unless you have the new conclave DLC which I don't have and I don't plan on buying because I've heard bad things about it and I've seen bad things about it either way let's talk about what you can do so obviously you can appoint new ones and uh, when you click a point, you're going to see this type of screen, which I should have explained in the last episode probably, because it's a very basic screen. You see it for a lot of things when choosing a wife, when choosing commanders, everything. Uh, it's just, it's not, it looks like a lot of stuff, but it's not actually that much. Essentially, you can see everyone in your realm that you could appoint to this position. Everyone you could possibly appoint to this position. Since we're looking at the Chancellor, uh, I believe it could be women as well as men. No, it's only men, I, I guess. Um... Either way, we could uh, we can choose a new dude to appoint. So let's look. This dude has 16 diplomacy skill. You can sort by the diplomacy skill. So there's there's no one that's better than him in our whole kingdom because he has 16. Everyone else has 14, 14, 12. And so like you can look at these columns if you forget what you, each one means. Uh, so that guy is pretty good. He's the best fit. The martial dude. We we don't have anyone better than him either. So that's a good fit. Uh, stewardship. Oh, excuse me. He has 18. Everyone else has 16 or lower. So, yeah. Uh, and I'm guessing the other two are the same. I'm not going to look at that. But that's where you can essentially switch people. You also get an opinion bonus. They actually like you a little better, which you can see by hovering over this. Uh, and that's a good, another reason you might want to appoint, appoint them to their council. You can see a lot of stuff with this. If you just hover over a lot of stuff in this game, it'll tell you more stuff, which is, uh, which is, really, which is really good. It'll tell you a lot of stuff that happens. When you're new to the game, just kind of take it slow. Make sure you want to do what you're going to do if you're about to do something. And make sure that you know what it'll do, essentially. So what do we do with each of these councils? What do they actually do? Well, you can forbid them to lead armies like you came yourself. Normally, I just don't worry about that. Uh, and then beyond that, they actually have a, the, these very important jobs they can do. So the Chancellor can improve diplomatic relations, fabricate claims, sow dissent. And the Marshal can suppress revolts. Train troops, research military tech. Steward can collect taxes, oversee construction, research economy tech. Spy master can study technology, build a spy network, or scheme. A court chaplain can proselytize, research cultural tech, and improve religious relations. That's a lot to take in, I know. It seems like a lot, but uh, trust me, you're only going to probably use like half of these for the most part. So what I normally do is uh, I only use a couple of these for each. Um, let's, let's so let's just start with the marshal because you know military is a big part of this game. Uh, declaring wars and conquering stuff uh, on the field of battle is a, is a big part of this game. So our marshal dude is, is he's a he's a decent enough dude. Uh, so what do we want to send him to do? Suppress revolts? Well, we're probably gonna not gonna have any trouble with that because uh, 
everyone kind of likes us and there's nothing really special going on that would you know make that happen really uh, we could train troops which is a pretty good one you get more troops your levy size is the amount of troops you can raise which we'll get to later your reinforcement rate is important if you lose a lot of troops in battle you want them to come back quicker uh, so that's good and you can see the percentage chances per year uh, and it's not at the end of the year that it does it it's mostly just like that's just an average you know I don't, I don't know how to explain it uh, essentially any day you can have that happen but that's just the overall chance of it happening in one year and you can also research military tech which can be decent and we'll get to technology later it's a, a fairly minor part but you could uh, you can actually research it and get more technology and also make it spread faster if your capital is higher tech uh, which you can see in the province screen uh, if your problem if, if it has higher like military advances it can spread over time uh, and you can oh I, I should not click on that I skipped over one and that's that's the technology screen we'll get to that later um, you can see it here too uh, I don't want to overload you guys either way what I normally do is I train troops and you can train it in any of the the provinces or things that you own directly uh, so obviously we own all this land again uh, remember but we're gonna only we only have these three provinces directly and that goes back to the domain limit so let's put him in our capital normally your capital is gonna have the most troops so we're gonna get the most benefit you know if we get if it's a percentage bonus we're gonna get more proportionally if we put it in our largest army province uh, let's go to the steward next so the steward can collect taxes oversee construction and research economy tech uh, this one can be pretty good if you're trying to, you know, kind of like the military dude, and spread technology and find new technology points and stuff. I don't normally do that, though. Uh, sometimes I do. Oversee construction, it, it's okay if you're planning on building buildings, which we'll get to later. Uh, but it's normally not that good. I use it very, uh, very uh, infrequently, very few times. The one I almost always do is collect taxes. Collect taxes is so good. Uh, you get more taxes over time from there. And not only that, but t there's a 10% chance every year that you get a special tie. Then essentially what that means is that you, did, you just get a, a chunk of money for free without doing anything. And that's really good. We only have 73 gold right now, which is not that much. So we'll set here our dude also in the capital to uh, collect taxes. You can see the little, the little models there. And you can hover over them if you want to see what they're doing exactly. Uh, let's go on to, let's skip the spy master for now, skip the chancellor for now. Those guys are fairly complex. Let's go to the court chaplain. If you're playing in a place that's already all Catholic, which you can see in the religious map mode, you can explore this on your own. There's a little bit of like pagans up here and over here. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, of Sunni down in Spain. Uh, we'll, we'll, we probably won't touch on that much, but uh, you can check that out on your own. But if you're not in a place where you have a lot of religious conflict, then your court chaplain's not going to see much action. Uh, see, normally you'd proselytize and you can convert stuff. You can convert the counties that you own that are a different religion. You can convert subjects. In other words, if you have a count who's like Orthodox, if you're Catholic, you can try to convert them. Uh, all that stuff. Um, however, there, there's like some bad events that could fire, but they're not very likely. Uh, you can research cultural tech. I actually do this one fairly often, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. Uh, and then this one, improve religious relations. This is the one that you're going to probably use most frequently if you're starting where I'm starting. Because uh, essentially, you can use this to improve, relation, improve relations. Yeah, improve relations with a religious figure. And what this is good for is you can actually just send them to the papacy in Rome. You put them in Rome. And because the, the Pope owns this land directly, Pope Alexander II in this, uh, in this case, because of that, uh, there's a chance that instead of, uh, instead of improving with the, the, the bishops or whatever that are in this province, he'll actually improve the Pope's relations of you. And this is good because, you know, sometimes other kings will call for your excommunication and the Pope, if he doesn't like you, he might listen to them. And that's not good, because if you're excommunicated, everyone hates you. And that's not a good thing. So you don't want to get on the post bad side. It's good to improve your relations a little. After that, you might want to do, uh, not the right screen, you might want to do the cultural tech. Uh, the cultural tech is a, like the other ones in that you just, you know, you basically get more technology, it spreads faster, and I'll talk about why cultural tech is important later on. So let's let's hit the the chancellor and the spy master. What are these guys doing here? What are what are the what are they up to? Uh, so we got the spy master. 
he can scheme. I, I rarely do this. Uh, I would say it's not very good at all. Uh, you can build a spy network, uh, and that's a fairly good one that I use quite a bit, and I'll explain why in a sec. Or you can study technology. Study technology is the one I do normally do the most, and essentially what you do is you you put him in a place somewhere else in the world that has better technology than you, and uh, we apparently we can't. We must have the best technology in the world. That doesn't seem right. Uh, but if you do that, then he goes... Normally you put him in Constantinople because they have really good technology there. If you put them there, then over time they'll just get uh, random technology points from any of the three categories that we kind of already touched on. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty good one. It's good to do if you don't have anything else to do. However, if you're plotting to kill someone, what you want to do is build a spy network in the area where they live, in their capital province where they're gonna be in court, you know, and so that's that's a good thing. We don't really need to do anything with him right now, so we're just not gonna worry about it, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, that's what the spy master is used for. He's fairly useful, he's gonna be fairly active for you. And the Chancellor is the other one. So the only two ones I really use are these two. I normally don't use the so descend, it doesn't really do that much for uh, for you in most cases, but uh it can help, I suppose. I've never even used it, really, so I, I couldn't even tell you. It You're probably not going to use it. It'll just, just be honest. Uh, fabricate claims and improve diplomatic relations. These are the ones you're going to be using exclusively, pretty much, uh, especially fabricate claims. But improve diplomatic relations has, it use, use, has its uses. So it's pretty pretty simple. We'll talk about this one first. It's pretty simple. You, you put them in a place in the court of a lord, and whoever's court that is, like if we put it into Paris, it would improve the relations of anyone whose court is in Paris. So it could be the king, it could also be the people who own these cities and baronies and stuff, which I'll, I'll t I need to touch on that in a little bit. But, you know, you improve, you put them in a place, it improves relations over time. That's, that's pretty much all it does. It's very self-explanatory. Uh, and you can do it with other people outside your realm as well. So if you're trying to make friends with a uh, foreign person. Uh, so then fabricate claims. What does this do? Well, if you do a fabrication of a claim, you can essentially, if I wanted to fabricate a claim on the Duchy of Toulouse, or the County of Rorerge, or the County of Toulouse, uh, what I would do is I would put him there to fabricate claims. I think we might as well just do that. And essentially, you can see, there's a 15% chance every year that he'll fabricate a claim on one of the titles in this province, whether that be the County of Toulouse or the Duchy of Toulouse. It can't do city level titles, uh, but that's not really important. You almost never mess with them. Uh, but yeah, so you can you can fabricate claims, and there's just it's just a chance based thing, which is uh, one thing that a lot of people have uh, complaints about for this game is that it's just chance based. You could go the whole game without ever getting them, uh, technically. Uh, but yeah, and if you have better diplomatic skill, you have a better chance of doing it quicker. So, uh, and that, that kind of is self-explanatory. So, uh, you can check your claims here, and I, I haven't really talked about that. I kind of skipped over it, so I guess I'll touch on that real quick. Um, so let's say that, like, my my daughter uh, inherits all my stuff, but I have, a, like, a, a second daughter or something. She wouldn't get anything uh, in the, the best of circumstances. We'll get to that in a little bit, what I mean by that. Uh, but then, well, no, 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 okay, I, I said this wrong. So, let's assume you have two daughters. The land gets split up between them, and we'll talk about why in a sec. The land would get split up between them. Uh, I have three duchies, so the main daughter would probably get two. The other daughter would probably get, like, one of the duchies. We would lose that. We would no longer control it. They would just be another different vassal, my sister, at that point. Because uh, once you die, you become your heir, which is, uh, at this point... You can't have it be two people, obviously. So our heir is just our oldest daughter. If we had another daughter, it wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't pass on to them. We'd become our our heir. Um, and I, I I'm gonna touch on that in the next uh, part of this little guide session thing. But if we um if we lose some land due to succession, you know, we become a daughter or a son, and then another son or daughter owns some of our land that we just owned previously. We actually inherit a claim on that, and if it's a strong claim, we can press it pretty much whenever and try to take that land back, and that's basically the, one of the main ways you're going to wage war. So fabricating claims is the only other way to really guarantee that you're going to be able to declare war on one. Because uh, like in EU4 and other grand strategy games, you can't declare war on someone unless you have a valid CB. So this is a casus belli, uh, that's what that means, casus belli, a uh, cause for war. 
And so we have one against him, Independence. You always have that as a sub-realm. But, like, look at this dude. We don't have a a, uh, a valid Casus Belly because we don't have any claims on anything he owns. And we don't have any... He's not excommunicated. There's nothing like that to give us a claim. If, if there's, like, an infidel next to you, that gives you a CB. But, yeah, you need claims. And uh, so fabrication is important for that reason. Uh, we don't have a lot of time in this video, but I think we'll go ahead and start talking about laws and cover that real quick. So what are laws? Well, laws are essentially the inheritance, uh, the, the ways that you inherit land or the, way, the ways that land is inherited in your titles. So you can see this is the Ducal Laws of Aquitaine. Uh, we also have the Kingdom of France. We can see the Royal Laws of France because they're two different titles. And we're in both of them. We own one completely, and then the other one is uh, one that we're under. So we have some say in it if it's like voting, which it's not right now, but it could be in the future. Um, so let's just look at this. So we have agnatic, cognatic, gobble, ga the gobble, yeah, gavel kind. And that's, it's very confusing. There's a lot of different ways uh, that you can have succession be. Uh, but let's just cover the basics. So gavel kind is not very good. And the reason being that, let's say I had two sons. Like I said before, in this system, if I have three duchies, all the duchies are going to get split up between all my sons. If I have more sons, it'll get split up even more to the point where all my land will get split up between my sons upon death. Which kind of makes sense. That's how it was a lot of times in the medieval world, at least. Uh, if I, on the other hand, had primogenitor, which is one of the best types in the game, and that is what France has, if I had that then the first son inherits everything, and then the other brothers just become uh, members of the court of them. And so that's a lot better. That's what you want, because you want your realm to stay central after you die. You don't want it to get split up. That's not normally a good thing to happen. So uh, so that's it's you don't want that, really. Um, and early on, that's one of the hardest things, is keeping your realm intact as you die and become new characters. Um, so how do you change the laws and stuff? Well, you can hover over and see. It looks like a lot of random stuff, but there's just a couple basic ones. You have to reign for 10 years. Is that peace, new regency? You can kind of see all those. Primogenitor, you need some special stuff. You have to have everyone like you. All your vassals have to have a positive opinion or zero opinion. Uh, you also have to have a... Uh, you have to have... Crown authority... Uh, no. Crown authority has to be high or max and that is one of the hardest things to do uh, I think it's high and max right yeah um, either way you have to have that to a certain point before you can actually change your inheritance laws to primogenitor and one of the reasons that cultural tech points are so important is that you can't actually upgrade your crown authority past a certain point until you get your legalism up to level 2 or 3 or 4, whatever it is. Uh, we actually already start with it unlocked, which is ridiculous. I didn't realize that we started with it unlocked. That's really overpowered, actually. Uh, but normally you start with 2 and you have to get to 3. So that's one reason you might use your dude over here to research cultural tech in your capital. Anyways, and that's also like why you might use the Spy Master to get technology. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the basic of laws. Uh, I'll cover technology real quick, and I think that'll be it for this video as well. I said we were going to start. That's okay. Definitely next video we'll get going. So, uh, technology you have here. You got your military, economy, and culture. It's, it's pretty simple. Again, just like here, you got military, economy, culture. And those directly impact this stuff. And you also get some base. You know, you have some that you're going to get regardless. Uh, and that's all That's all that is. You can upgrade stuff. Eventually you'll get a pop-up up here showing, oh, you have technology points to spend. You have 100 points or whatever. You can invest in this. It costs us a lot more now. Uh, but yeah, you can invest, and uh, military is important, obviously. If you're using mostly heavy infantry or light infantry, you want to upgrade that first, probably. Siege equipment makes sieges go faster. Shipbuilding, you can build more ships. Cavalry. Anyways, it's very self-explanatory. Castles unlock new buildings, and you can hover all over, hover over all those on your own time to figure that out and see what they do. Uh, and uh, it's just very simple. And the last thing I guess I should say is with buildings, the way you build buildings, I'll cover this real quick as well because it's fairly easy. Um, you click on like one of the provinces you own directly. You don't even have to own it directly, but it's probably better to do that. So you click on like let's say you click on this. This is like your capital, the Bordeaux 
obviously is the, the province name. But then, like, in places like this, Saint-Onge is the name of the province, but Saint Saint-Is is the name of the capital. You know, it's like, uh, it's like if you had the state of, uh, the state of, uh, of, of Maryland here, uh, and then Annapolis is the, the, the capital, and that's what you're upgrading, essentially. And then these are, like, the other cities over here, uh, in, this would be, like, uh, like, Silver Spring and Bethesda and all the other cities in Maryland. I'm just using that because that's where I was born, so, and it's a state you guys might know. Anyways, though... Uh, so then if you click on this, you get this screen, and this is where you can upgrade your buildings. And it's very simple. It just costs this much money to upgrade, and that's what it'll give you after it upgrades. And that's the level it is now. It's it's very simple, and the time. Uh, you can also see a lot of other stuff on the screen, how many troops you're getting, how much tax you're getting. You can look through that. But uh, you can also switch between your other holdings. Uh, but anyways, that's fairly simple. You just use money and stuff, and then uh, you can invest in stuff to get more money, like, you know, uh, Castle Town, uh, Marketplaces or whatever. Um, jousting lists, is, no, that's different. But still, that's it's very, uh, very interesting. I like that part of the game. It's good to use your money to do that. Uh, but we covered three of the tabs. There's four more. It should speed up a little bit after this video. I'm, I'm sorry again that it's taking so long. I didn't think it would take me this long, but it's a very complex game, and so I hope you guys are enjoying these guides. Uh, please tell me if you do are are enjoying them and if they're helping. And uh, and I can if you have any questions. I should have said this before. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. I will definitely try to help as best I can. Thank you for watching though, and uh, go ahead and and leave a like and subscribe for more if you're enjoying this little mini series. And uh, come back uh, next time for some more some more information on CK2. Goodbye.